Hey everyone, let's discuss prebiotics versus probiotics. There is a difference. This is important. We'll cover that along with food sources, supplemental sources, guidelines for use, and then round out our discussion with the comparison of which one might be better. Okay, so probiotics are the microorganisms, either bacteria or yeast, that have a beneficial impact on the host, in this case, us. Prebiotics are specific types of fiber that feed those bacteria. Not all fiber are prebiotics, but nevertheless, prebiotics are the food that help to grow and foster the function of the bacteria. So probiotics are the organisms, prebiotics are their food. What about how they function? Well, they both have a degree of benefit for the gut. Probiotics are antimicrobial. They reduce leaky gut. They modulate the immune system via this very important receptor we've discussed in prior episodes, toll-like receptor 4, which is partially what governs leaky gut. Probiotics also aid in motility. They reduce gastrointestinal symptoms, although they're not super effective for metabolic health, for weight loss, for lowering of blood sugar. Whereas prebiotics have an edge and there is some impressive data for the ability of prebiotics to lower blood sugar and have a beneficial metabolic effect. Prebiotics also increase beneficial bacteria as we covered a moment ago. They modulate the immune system. They produce fuel for your enterocytes or your intestinal cells. This fuel is known as short chain fatty acids. However, sort of paradoxically, even though they produce these short chain fatty acids, they're not very robust prebiotics in their ability to reduce gastrointestinal symptoms. However, I would make one caveat that if you suspect candida or fungal overgrowth or yeast, you should certainly use a probiotic but this is where I think consideration to also adding a prebiotic should be thought through because when trying to counterbalance the fungal populations in the gut, it's probably most important that we really bolster the healthy bacterial populations. That hasn't been published. That's just something I've been thinking about more so from a clinical perspective. And by the way, if this has been helpful, please comment, subscribe, and share with one person you think this might help. Okay, so now coming to dietary sources. Probiotic-containing foods are fermented foods. Kefir, yogurt, kombucha, and also sauerkraut and kimchi actually have both probiotics and prebiotics, so that's kind of a two-for-one. Regarding the recommended intake for probiotic-rich foods, fermented foods, there's no consensus amount. One serving per day is usually sufficient, one serving often being a cup, and this level of consumption has been demonstrated to lead to health benefits. Regarding food sources of prebiotics, fruits, vegetables, dairy, grains, beans, legumes, and nuts. Again, there is no consensus regarding what the optimal intake is. However, I did find a 2023 randomized control trial, interesting. They administered seven servings per day of prebiotic-rich foods, and they found improvements in mood, anxiety, stress, and sleep. So this then follows that seven servings per day of prebiotic-rich foods is probably a good target. So if you're having three meals per day, this would be two to three servings per meal. And conversely, a total dietary fiber intake of 25 to 30 grams is a good aim. Here's a list of high fiber versus low fiber fruits and vegetables. And what you could do is take stock of what you're eating and try to incorporate more of the higher fiber and a bit less of the lower fiber. It's not to say you should avoid lower fiber. But this is one sort of tweak toward optimization you can consider. So higher fiber fruits would be blueberries, avocado, apple raspberries, pomegranate, and kiwi. Low fiber fruits, oranges, strawberries, watermelon, banana, mango, cantaloupe, and peaches. And then coming over to high fiber vegetables, artichoke, turnip, green peas, sweet potatoes, Brussels sprouts, 
broccoli and collard greens, whereas lower fiber would be iceberg lettuce, mushrooms, bell peppers, cucumber, celery, zucchini, and tomatoes. And again, it's not to say that you should be avoiding the lower fiber, but make a note of the higher fiber and try to incorporate some of these. And if you really wanted to go all the way, you could count out what you're getting in a day and try to obtain 25 to 30 grams of dietary fiber. Alrighty, so then we come to the very important usage guidelines. There's a few caveats here. As a clinician, I can tell you that early in my career, I thought whatever the diet or the intervention was, early phase, I was jazzed about and I thought was gonna help everybody. The paleo diet, low carb, probiotics, prebiotic supplementation, glutathione. And then with time, you see that virtually any intervention will help some people, not help others, and even flare some. So because of that, here is a framework. High fiber can be helpful for some. It will aggravate those with sensitive digestion. So you just wanna be aware of that. Now, conversely, higher probiotic foods, fermented foods, can aggravate and flare the symptoms for other people. So the solution here is actually simple. Change one thing at a time. Let's say you're going to increase your fermented food intake, therefore your probiotics. Do this for about a week and then reappraise. If it's the right change for your gut, you will see general improvements in how you feel. Now, conversely, you can, in isolation, try upping of your dietary prebiotic and fiber intake, and at the end of a week, reevaluate. If this is the right thing for your gut, you will notice that you generally feel better. Now, the specific symptoms don't matter. For some people, a flare may look like constipation. For someone else, it could be diarrhea. For someone else, it might be insomnia. And for someone else, it might be a runny nose. The specific symptomatic manifestations of an intolerance are very idiosyncratic, meaning they're different for different people. It's the timing that matters. And that's why to simplify this, change one thing at a time, take stock after a week, and that will tell you, are you doing the right thing? Yes or no. If you get sidetracked or if you get hurdled, you can always reach out to the clinic. Myself or someone on our team would love to help you. This is what I enjoy is helping people navigate these tripwires so they can improve their gut health and reap all the benefits therein. Okay, so continuing to supplemental probiotics. We've discussed on the show in the past at nauseum this framework of probiotics partitioning into one of three formula types. There's your traditional blend of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium species. So on the label, you'll see various lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. Conversely, there's a healthy fungus, either as Saccharomyces boulardii or Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And then finally, the soil-based probiotic type will have some type of bacillus species, bacillus coagulans, bacillus lichenformis, bacillus subtilis. Any one of these formulas is fine to start with. For the lactobifido, you're looking at a dose of one to 50 billion per day. For the saccharomyces, anywhere from four to 10 billion per day. And for the soil-based, anywhere from two to six billion per day. Just to give you a starting point with formula selection, dose, and for duration, two to three months is usually a good interval to assess initial effectiveness. Coming over to prebiotics. The main types of prebiotics are inulin, resistant starches, what's known as FOS or GOS, so fructo-oligosaccharides or galacto-oligosaccharides, and then finally, partially hydrolyzed guar gum. And many, most formulas will contain some combination of these and I think that's probably the best way to utilize these because in foods, you will often have a diverse array of prebiotics and not necessarily just one. Regarding dosages, there is an important clarification for prebiotics specifically. Most research has used between 5 to 15 grams per day. However, a 2013 review paper found that in those who have otherwise sensitive digestion, a dose of three to five grams per day was both effective, helpful, but also was not enough, a high enough dose to trigger symptoms. So this I think is important to bear in mind 
if you're someone who historically has noticed if you don't eat the right way, let's say, or you're under stress, you may notice you get backed up or you have bloating, abdominal pain, diarrhea, or reflux. I wouldn't jump right into something like 10 or 15 grams per day of prebiotics. If anything, I would start at three to five, reevaluate, and then slowly ramp up over time. More is not always better, but those are some guidelines to navigate the use of prebiotics. And there's a few formulas here that I'll share with you in brief regarding supplemental prebiotics. Biota Boost is the formula we use in the clinic, and a four capsule serving gives you three grams. Conversely, Garden of Life has an organic fiber supplement. Two scoops gives you 10 grams. So now we're getting a little bit higher. And this company, Hyperbiotics, has a prebiotic formula called Hyperbiotic Vegan Prebiotic. Two scoops gives you 14 grams. So any of these would be suitable. Again, if you've noticed your gut is a bit reactive, I would start with the three to five grams and then reevaluate, potentially building up to a higher dose. There can be a little bit of gas and flatulence that's transient when starting on or increasing your dose of prebiotics. So that's important to bear in mind. And as long as you're not noticing pain, fatigue, and the only thing is really just blowing some wind, then it's probably your microbiota adjusting. Give that a few days to a week, and if that subsides, great. If it continues or you start noticing other negative reactions like abdominal pain, discomfort, reflux, fatigue, that's telling you to back off. You may have also heard this term symbiotics. This is a combination of probiotic and prebiotic in the same formula. And these are all fine and good. My preference is to use them separately because as we've outlined, you want to be able to throttle, especially with the prebiotic, the dose. And so when you're taking a fixed formula as a symbiotic, you don't have that control. Okay, and then the final point here, sort of the showdown between probiotics and prebiotics, which one is better? Not that it's a contest, but I did find from the very noteworthy journal Cell a 2021 paper to be quite insightful. They compared either a high fiber, so this will also have higher prebiotic diet, versus a high fermented food diet, six servings per day of fermented foods. And they found that the fermented food diet was superior at improving the diversity of the microbiota, and in reducing levels of inflammation. Both diets were helpful, but there is an edge toward the probiotic-rich fermented food-based diet. When we compare that with a meta-analysis from 2023, looking at those with digestive symptoms as seen in IBS, administering prebiotics, and finding no benefit, this is why I tend to favor probiotics over prebiotics, they both have their time and their place just to give you sort of a hierarchy with how you start utilizing these either dietarily or supplementally. And so in close, probiotics are the bacteria or the fungus. Prebiotics are the food that feeds them. Both can be helpful and important. They will not be helpful for everyone. So run that simple experiment we talked about earlier. And I think we can say that there's a slight edge favoring probiotics. Okay, well, I hope this helps, and please do let me know in the comments what you think and or how your experiment goes. 